Uh, Dr. Alan Franz Lubers is a USDA professor of soil science and runs the Soil Ecology and Management Lab at North Carolina State University. His research program focuses on soil and organic matter management for the development of sustainable agricultural systems. He specializes in assessment methods of biological soil quality uh, and uses these tools to interpret the effects of management on soil resources. He's a member of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. He has a PhD from Texas A&M, and he has humble uh, roots, as he says, uh, on the Nebraska rural area. So Alan, thank you so much for coming today. Hopefully we won't be blasted by any more static, but we really appreciate your being with us. students here. I, I was, I, I wish I had uh, prepared this, because, but I only saw it on the screen right before I came into the room, or when I came into the room, about the, your seal, the, the Cal Poly seal. Everyone know about the Cal Poly seal? Tell me about the Cal Poly seal. Learn by doing. Pardon? Learn by doing. Learn by doing? Well, I did this, 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 this seal here. You know about that seal? So, uh, I don't know Latin. <laughs> what, what, what is the Scara Faciendo? Learn by doing. Learn by doing. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, and, and are, are you all in, in mathematics or engineering or agriculture? Let's see, the four years, right? Agriculture. Agriculture. Yeah. What are the four years? I, I, I guess chemistry is perhaps one of them. Is that correct? Okay, I just wanted to get you. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, uh, okay. Um, uh, thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. As uh, Hunter mentioned, I, I am just a farm. Uh, I didn't. I did not grow up on a farm, but I grew up in a smaller town, probably than most. Probably, well, it was larger than this. Okay, but it was. It, it was not very large. Just to say that actually, you know, my roots are from from uh, a rural background, and uh, I was fortunate enough to have good experiences and uh, developed a program that I, I'm very proud of, and that, uh, that hopefully will we'll gain something from as well. Are the lights okay? You, can... you want me to turn the stage lights off? Well, it seems like see, I don't need to have the lights on here. Okay. And a little bit. Okay, so I've got enough uh, material to, to last for the, the 50 minute, minute period. So uh, but if you have some questions, hopefully you will uh, I'll leave a little time. Okay, so I'm going to, I have, uh, two, I have three screens here, and so I'm not sure what I'm going to do here. So I don't want to necessarily uh, walk around too much, but I do want to let you know uh, that um, I'm going to go back and forth. So this, this is the, the, the issue is that we have a large, large growing human population, and you've probably heard this a lot uh, in the last, during your studies here. And th this is a concern because we have a lot of people that need to be fed, and food production is really, really important. So the, the, the issue is that we have a lot of people and there's protection for a lot more. Now there's an argument that says that, well, we, we need to produce so much more because all the people want to eat just like we do. Uh, it's probably not going to happen that way, but uh, because we cannot predict the future necessarily. But we do know that there probably are going to be more people. And how we're going to feed those people is, is of importance. So agriculture has had a response. What you see here is the uh, cereal production from 1960 to 2000. So uh, Dr. Tillman uh, published this research. I'm not sure what the production is uh, in the last uh, 17 years or 20 years from the last data point there. But uh, it shows that agricultural production has increased a lot. And there, there have been some good reasons for that. Technology, technology has been a key part of that, fertilizer, genetics. The use of water, things like that are, are very important. So agriculture can respond to the need for more food production. Uh, so the cereal production has, has increased more than twofold in that, in that last 40-year uh, period. But the projections are that it needs to you know, double again. And so can we really do that? The consequence of that uh, agricultural production is that we have seen a large increases, and I'm going to point on this side here, the large increase in nitrogen, in water, and in phosphorus. And in, uh, for nitrogen, the, the increase has been more than 10 times the amount that it was in the, in, in 2000, in the 1960s. And that's, that's important because nitrogen is needed. We have to, our systems are not able to produce enough nitrogen, and so we need nitrogen fertilizer. 
We also have uh, a large increase in phosphorus, more than two times the, the amount of uh, phosphorus that was uh, applied earlier on, and water has increased as well. And obviously, in water is, is an important issue in California. And they, they, these are important implications because resources become limited. We cannot, we don't have endless resources. So we cannot. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're treating our soils like dirt, and they are. Th this picture was just taken two two days ago in North Carolina, where I came from, and it, it showed that uh, that the soils are, are blowing away, are washing away. We're not treating them with uh, enough respect. That actually, we are we, Our goal is to produce more food, but how can we do it if we if we don't uh, protect our soils? Because that's the basis for our food production. And then the consequences are that, that all of the areas where there's human intervention, so the areas with in yellow and orange, they, there's, there's a lot of human population. And you see in North America, there's a lot of human population, certainly in the upper and Midwest areas. The consequences are not isolated to those areas, though. They're, they're on the water. So all of these dots here on the, on the exterior are hypoxic zones. And so the nutrients running off from our land are, are entering the, the oceans and the waters. And it's not just in the ocean waters, it's in the rivers as well. And so our, our activities have an impact, our collective activities. And we can look around in, in Europe, of course, there's a, there's a large problem. There's a large problem in, in Asia. But you see some other areas where, like in Africa, in India, in, in other uh, areas of Asia, that there, where there's large human populations, but there's not necessarily those hypoxic zones. So what does that really tell us? Does it say that we should live like people in Africa and India? I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm just saying that, that uh, what, what probably most people in the United States would say, no, that's not a you know, suitable alternative. We should not have te uh, technologies that are not necessarily high-tech uh, high tech and, and cutting edge. But it does show that if, if those locations are limited by their resources, they're not polluting their, their, uh, their estuaries. And it just shows that uh, we need to have uh, some sort of balance. That, that what is that term, hypoxic? What does it mean, hypoxia? So it's, it's uh, an enrichment of the water bodies. Right, and, and so the, the algal blooms uh, increase, the, the, the water uh, organisms they, they increase, and they, they, they decompose, and they consume the oxygen in the water. It often leads to fish kills. So it reduces, it reduces the, the oxygen level. So we, we could, uh, the alternative would be that we uh, revert our, our lands to more natural situation. But as you can see in this picture here, there's there's very little food production there. So we, it's, it's not necessarily a suitable alternative just to, to revert our land production into something less intense because we have people on the planet. Right? I mean, the best would be that each one of us produces our own food. Is this possible? It is possible in certain cases. And I would applaud you if you do that. But most people don't want to do that. We've come to around over the last 100, 150 years where it's just not a plausible situation. So we have to balance this. How do we balance it? How do we make greater food production and improve the environment? These are two laudable goals. We need to do both. But it, to do them simultaneously is really going to be difficult. But it's for us, for you as students, for us as, as active professionals, to be able to find ways to do them. And that's, that's the goal that I think that uh, we, we want to, to help build, is, is that for me, as a soil scientist, I can contrib contribute something. I, there's no way I have all of the, uh, all of the solutions in hand. It, it takes a lot of different people working together. But it's the management. So management being that, that we, as people, are intervening in how we control production and environment. That's, that's what's important. So I want to go to the basics. We have one planet. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, you, you may be studying uh, some things that, are, that go beyond that planet, but so most of us believe that we have one planet, right? That we can really uh, live on. And we have these different spheres, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the lithosphere. These are important elements of our, of our natural world. And that's, these are the basics. So we should start with the basics if we want to find solutions. And soil intersects all of them. That's, what's the, that's the beauty of, of a soil science, is, is that it, it's actually the intersection of all of these, these spheres. So the ecosystem service concept is, is that with uh, these, this environment, the world that we live in, can provide us with things. We, it provides us food, shelter, things like that. It, it uh, also regulates the climate, the water cycle. These are, these are very important things that soil actually has an important role to play in how these services are provided. 
the cultural services may be a little bit uh, uh, far reaching, but uh, there are landscapes that, uh, you, you know, in California, in, in Pennsylvania, places that, that are just beautiful to see. And agriculture has a large role to play in that. At least from my perspective, growing up in a farm background, agricultural landscapes are, can be very beautiful. But they can also be very unpleasant if they are just polluted and burned. And then there are these uh, uh, supporting services, such as nutrient cycling and water cycling, that are very important as well. So this, this forms the basis for, for our understanding of how we manipulate the natural world. So in a perfect world, this is, this is what it would, you know, diagrammatically would look like. We have people sitting upon all of these services, the regulating services, the supporting services, and the provisioning services. And, and you sail off into the sunset. It's all a nice story book, right? But there are problems. We, as people, manage soil. The harsh reality is that the services that uh, we're trying to get from our natural world are disrupted by, by what we do to the land. And so the provisioning services, you would think that, okay, that's, that's pretty, pretty uh, straightforward. We try to produce food, fiber, and, and, and fuel, and uh, feed, that, uh, but it doesn't always occur. We have droughts, we have floods, and it's partly because of our, our, in, our doing of, of the landscape. But mostly we get a good provisioning service. But the supporting services, the, the nutrient cycle disruption, we have uh, the hypoxia, the, the nutrient water quality issues, the regulating services of climate control, the, the, the climate change, and what we do to the land is important. And then the cultural services, the, the, uh, the uh, landscape approaches and how we treat our land. And they, they're being disrupted. It's from our doing, it's management control. So I would like to bring us to why why we, why carbon why carbon. So soil organic matter is, is the central theme that, uh, that I'm going to provide for you. It, it relates to productivity. It relates to water relations. It relates to nutrient cycling. It relates to biodiversity, and it re relates to greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. So these these areas are important in a lot of respects. They're they're global in nature. But they react upon them locally. And they're, they're, they're facets that are important for a lot of us. They have economic uh, impacts. They have cultural impacts. They have uh, ecological impacts. And it's all really controlled by how we manage our soils. It's really that simple. I believe that it's really that simple. It's, it's, it's how we manage our soils has a lot of implications on how we, we have our, 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 our environment. So. So I'm going to go through, well, what is, there was a question, okay, what is hypoxia? Okay, well, what is soil carbon itself? So carbon in soil organic matter is generally, we consider it 58% of the organic matter is, is carbon. So it's the largest constituency of organic matter. So we, when we talk about soil organic matter, we're really measuring soil organic carbon in most laboratories. Some laboratories use a loss on ignition, so it's actually matter that's being lost. But in general, most of the laboratories use carbon. There's also carbonate minerals. Calcium carbonate is a, is a very important uh, carbon source in, in, in our environment as well. But the organic matter is composed of living components. That's plant biomass, the faunal fa fa biomass, microbial biomass, and non-living components. Well, there are various components there, the humus, the particulate matter, uh, the, the inorganic or material that, that can, can reside there. So carbonate is, is present in our soils. And uh, it's important for the ecosystem properties, processes, processes and functions. And the, from the physical aspect, we have color, which is, um, I'm, this is, this is a basic introduction to, to solar organic matter. And that color is important because it actually absorbs heat. <coughs> so that's important because that, um, plants need a certain temperature and that, that can be a certain attribute of the soil. Uh, it has low solubility, meaning that it, it, uh, it resides in soil for a long period. It doesn't just dissolve and, and go away uh, very quickly, like, uh, say, a commercial fertilizer application. It retains water, and this is a very important part because it acts like a sponge. It has, or when, when a sponge absorbs water, it doesn't really change its volume necessarily. It changes somewhat, but it, it absorbs much more than its, than its, uh, than its uh, mass would indicate. And so that's, that's what organic matter is like. It's like a, a sponge. And so it, water cycling, water infiltration, water retention are, are very important attributes of, of soil and organic matter provides that. And it stabilizes soil structure. So the phys physical attributes of 
soil that's well structured allows water to be to, to enter the soil. And it allows organisms to design the soil, provides a habitat for it. So an, an example of you know, the effect of organic matter on water-related properties would be that, that soil organic carbon, if you increase soil organic carbon on the x-axis, one would increase the mean weight diameter of the water stable aggregate. So that's long term to say aggregation or structure. It's way we quantify the mean weight diameter. So it's the, the actual size of the aggregates and it's the average weight of it because there's a distribution. There are small aggregates, there are large aggregates. So we, we put it on, on a mean weight. And it, it shows that, that with increasing organic carbon, we increase the diameter. So there's a strong implication. As we increase organic carbon, there's also an increase in water infiltration. So these are empirical data that have been collected and that, that actually support the concept that, that yes, so organic matter is important for water infiltration, it's important for uh, aggregation. Another example of water storage is this complex diagram, and, and I'm going to uh, kind of lead you through it. We have to, on the left is going to be a sand soil, and on the right it's going to be a, a finer textured soil. But the, the uh, two lines here, that's the point where, where plants cannot extract any more water from the sand. And that difference there is what is considered available water. So as you can see here that the soil organic matter when it's at a low level, it has a very low uh, level of available water. But if you increase the organic matter, it can, it, it can double, triple, and or quadruple the amount of water that it can hold. Now it's no easy fact to change the organic matter, but it, can, it is possible with time. But it just shows that there is an important attribute that organic matter does increase available water. This is a silk loam soil, so there are some certain silk loams in California. And that, uh, the, the, this here shows that at 1% organic matter, there's 12.9% water that can be held in the available water. And at 5%, it's 27.7. So more than doubling of the, of the water can be stored in soil if you increase the organic matter. And that's just the retention. That's not the infiltration itself. So water runoff is a big, big issue for, for nutrient cycling as well as for, for uh, any, any other uh, getting uh, efficient use of water. So the chemistry uh, part of, of soil, or organic carbon, is that the soil organic matter holds cations. So that's, that, that's what we uh, label as cation exchange capacity. The greater the organic matter, the greater the cation exchange capacity will be. That means that the fertility of the soil will be greater as far as uh, uh, holding calcium and magnesium in particular. There's also this buffering capacity when, when actually you have uh, more organic matter, the pH will not change as dramatically. You are, the plant roots are, have a more stable environment to, to experience, and so then they, they, the plants can take up nutrients uh, at a greater rate. There's a, a, an idea of chelation of metals. And this can be important for uh, increasing the availability of certain metals, uh, for iron and aluminum. Or aluminum is typically not necessarily what we want to see, but uh, phosphorus is, is bound by these, these in, in interaction with iron and aluminum. Phosphorus is made available. And this chelation of metals can be very important in that it allows phosphorus to become more of it. Or it can tie up a certain elements, such as aluminum. So it, it actually can bind the aluminum so that uh, it is not having a toxic effect on, on plants. So that's an important aspect of soil organic. And then the, the, the xenobiotics, the, those materials that are not natural, that are applied to soil for pest control or for industrial waste disposal. These, these, these uh, xenobiotics are important because they can contaminate the soil and soil organic matter is, is able to either bind with them or provide the habitat for or organisms so that they can decompose these, these xenobiotics. So here's an example of a uh, simple example. It's not a, a really straightforward example, but of, of increasing organic carbon and the amount of extractable calcium. So in general, there's a relationship. Where this would happen to be from a spatial distribution in a pasture in, in Georgia that we we found that the increase in organic carbon led to increase in cation uh, exchange or cation retention. And so there's an, uh, there's, there's uh, evidence for this. Now the biological part is is a uh, part is really the most important part. In in that so this is the the reservoir for metabolic energy. So you have organisms in soil that need energy, just like you and I need food on a daily basis. 
micro, microbes in the soil, bacteria and fungi, they need, or they need food on a daily basis. They cannot make their food on, most organisms in the soil don't make their food on their own. They rely on plants to make that food for them, just as we rely on plants to make our food. Of course, it can get, be fed through, through animals and consume the animal products, but that's, it, it's all ultimately from, from plant food. So the, there's a source of macronutrients. So the mineralization of this organic, organic matter provides uh, nutrients to the plants because first it's bound in, in the organic matter, but then by the activity of the organisms, it's released to the, to the plants. And so there's, there's this source of nutrients, the nitrogen in, in particular, and as, as well as phosphorus and sulfur. And there are enzymatic activities from microbial activity, and they can be either suppressed by organic matter or they can be enhanced by it. And that's the important, because sometimes we want to have enzymatic activity, say the release of, of nutrients, but other times when we're applying, say, a urea fertilizer, and we want to have inhibition of the urea because, so that we can actually control the release of the, of the nitrogen. And that's, that's a practical example that's, that's out there, is that we want to inhibit the enzymatic activity in some cases. And then just in general ecosystem resilience. There's, there's uh, an idea that, that soil biology is important in, in creating an environment that uh, has so much competitive activity that, that the, the ecosystem cannot fail. That there's always uh, an activity going on in soil that allows plants to function properly and that the ecosystem will, will function. 